Okay, let's get to it. <laughs> Today I'm going to make it interesting. I'm talking about the 19th century Persian travelogues and, as I call it, the rise of a new historical consciousness in Iran. What do I mean by it? I'm going to show you the good pictures. Before the 19th century, before the Vajras came into contact with Western powers, the Vajras specifically in the 19th century, the beginning of the 19th century, they came into contact with the Russian Empire. Fatali Shah, the young Vajra monarch, at the time that he came to power, he was 25. And he had all those designs in the Caucasus, his royal ambitions in the Caucasus close to the Caspian Sea, were vast and uncontrolled. Alexander I was doing the same in Russia. So the, the Russian monarch had certain claims to certain territories in the Caucasus. So the Iranians and the Russians, at that time the Vajras and the Russians, come, come into contact with each other, a couple of fights. It happens at the turn of the 18th century and early 19th century. This is a picture of the Battle of Sultanabad in 1812. The wars between the Russians and the Persians went on for a couple of decades. And what I would like to stress is that it wasn't that the Russians always won the battles. Sometimes the Persians won, sometimes the Russians won. But as a result of this, and eventually the Bajar Empire lost to the, the Tsarist of Russia, and they had to concede the large territories present in Armenia, Georgia, parts of Azerbaijan, to the Russian Empire. After they lost all their territories, the crown priest Abbas Mirza and the Fat Ali Shah, this picture of Fat Ali Shah is this guy here, and the crown, crown prince, this younger guy is here, the Fat Ali Shah is in the center. They hired a group of Australian French uh, military advisors to reform, modernize their military. So they fought with themselves that now. So now that they start fighting with all the things the empires outside their territories, they start to think of their borders as the vulnerable. What should they do? As they are fighting the Russians, they seek help elsewhere. One of the things of the steps that they take in war against Russia is going and talking with Napoleon. This is a picture for 1807, as you can see. The Iranian ambassador goes to Finkenstein Castle in France, and they start negotiating with Napoleon. What I call the new historical consciousness, I trace the origins to these dealings of the Iranians with the outside world. Before that, they called the Iranian or the Baja or the Safavid domains, they called them the protected realms, like Imam said. Or they had this amorphous and vast land that they thought they are controlling. Hence, the name of the Baja kings were the shadow of God, pivot of the universe, sword of God, stuff like that. They thought that they're controlling everywhere. They had no idea what the border is. In the 19th century, they started to have a sense of that. Eventually, in 1830s and 1820s, they have to sign two very, not very uh, proud treaties with the Russians. One of them is Bolestan, the other is Turkmen Chai. This picture, that's what I like, it kind of does a translating a travelogue, early 19th century travelogue, and Colonel Ivan Fyodorovich Paskevich, this is the guy I like, he's the commander of the Russian forces in the Caucasus. For many years he was there. This is the guy who goes with Abbas Mirza, this is the Iranian crown prince, and they sign the treaties. And according to those treaties, they can cede a large portion of their territories to the Russian Empire uh, adjacent to the Caspian Sea. What they do, they start a series of reforms. In the beginning of the 19th century, the reforms are military reforms, scientific reforms, reforms in the administration. But in the mid-19th century, that's what a myriad of Iranian studies and scholars point to. With the establishment of the first polytechnic school in Iran, Dar al in Tehran, things start to change. In Dar al Funun, they teach modern languages, they teach modern literature, they teach modern technology, modern medicine. And the graduates of the Dar al Funun go to be the pioneers of certain reforms and further reforms in the other decades of the 19th century. So this is a very prominent event in Iranian history in the 19th century. And this is the picture of the gate of the Dar al Funun. So as a result of all these changes, beginning of 19th century, you have military reforms, and then you have reforms in administration, and then you have reforms in the educational system. A new class of Iranians become literate. This class is not too large. The class of the literate Iranians belong to the elite, to the people who work in the bazaar or market, or those people who are affiliated with the uh, Shia or the Ma. So literate people from the higher strands of society get the chance to go to Dar al -Fum. There's one Dar al in Tehran, there's one Dar al -Fum in the provincial capital of Tabriz. So the schools mushroom in Iran, and the elite people get the education. As a result of that, a new public sphere, a new class of Iranian intellectuals emerge in Iran. 
One of the ones that I like to talk about, his name is Ali Ahmadzadeh. He's the most prominent Iranian intellectual in the 19th century. He's the one who espoused the liberal ideas, the execution of liberal ideas in Iran. In his work, and this is, I'm quoting from one of his most prominent books, that's how he lays out what he means by a liberal, how Iranians should be liberal. He says liberal is the person who is entirely liberated in his thoughts and is not limited by religious restrictions at all. A liberal never believes in the phenomena outside the grasp of reason and the natural world, although most of the tribes of the world believe in those phenomena, and although the texts of history and other books confirm the truth of such phenomena. So for Ahunzade, the liberal is a person who is a rational thinker, the person who revisits the religious thinking in Iran, and of course that's a political thinker. So I argue that Ahunzade, I, along with others, but I argue that Ahunzade lays the foundations for a new intellectual discourse. And these intellectuals are liberal in orientation, or liberal, or liberal minded, or liberal oriented. They try to expose liberal ideas. Tickets of liberal ideas are individualism, the importance of the individual, separation of the religious and the political establishment. And what I find very interesting, an, an emphasis on people. Before the 19th century, before all these intellectual transformations, Iranian people are called peasants, or they are called servants of the king, or simply Muslims. In the 19th century, with all these intellectual developments, and you see in the works of the likes of Ahmadzad, they start to talk about Iranians as people. So how I describe it to my friend is that before the 19th century, you have two dominant classes dominating Iranian politics. One of them is the religious establishment, one of them is the Qajar monarchy. So they believe that they are controlling the society. At that time, that's how I showed, people are here. The level of people are here. They don't consider people. People are peasants. They can do whatever they want. In the 19th century, the, the position of the people in the political discussions get elevated. Of course, people don't go on the same footing with the political and the religious establishment in the 19th century. It happens in the 20th century, after the Constitutional Revolution. But this shift, the importance, the, the light that they shed to people as people who should be uh, influential in their own political well-being is very significant to me. This is 19th century, second part of the 19th century. After Ahun Zadeh, another person which I find very interesting is Malcolm Khan. Mirza Malcolm Khan was very close to Nasser Din Shah. Nasser Din Shah is the Iranian monarch who ruled Iran, the Qajar monarch, for the second half of the 19th century. He was very close to Nasser Din Shah. He worked in various capacities in the Qajar administration. He was the Iranian ambassador in Italy, in France, in London. When the Iranian monarch Nasser Din Shah wanted to go to Europe, and this is very interesting, in 1873, when the Iranian monarch went to Europe, in his travel line, Nasser Din Shah talks in 20, 25 different places about Malcolm Khan. I went to Austria, I saw Malcolm Khan. I went to Paris, I saw Malcolm Khan. I went to Italy, I saw Malcolm Khan. They were very close. But, as happens with all those bro relationships and romances, they fall out. And what happens, Malcolm Khan starts to promote after Ahmad Zadeh. Malcolm Khan is in daily or in weekly correspondence with Ahmad Zadeh. He starts to promote liberal ideas. But to him, the most important liberal idea is the rule of law. So while he's in London between 1889, I missed one. 1889 and 1898, he publishes a newspaper called The Law or Qanun. And the Qanun is free of charge. And in Nasser Din Shah's memoirs, Nasser Din Shah was very angered by this journal, which talks about the rule of law, trying to respect his monarchical power. But still, the monarch reads that newspaper. The newspaper gets posted to Iran, and the Iranian intellectuals, although the intellectual class in Iran is very small, still, most of them read that newspaper. And I'm going to quote one of the issues of the newspaper, Matt, I'm not talking about law. Again, similar to Ahmad Zali, he talks about religion, he talks about rationality. Quote unquote, Iran is full of God given blessings. The only hindrance corrupting all these blessings is lack of law. Nobody owes anything in Iran because there's no law. We appoint rulers without law, we discharge brigadiers without law, we sell the rights of the government without law, we imprison God's creatures without law, we give away treasures without law, and tear open bodies without law. In India, in Paris, in Tiflis, in Egypt, in Istanbul, even among the Turkmen, everybody knows what their responsibilities and rights are. In Iran, nobody knows how faults and services are defined. Again, as they are promoting liberal ideas, they are also promoting this new idea of Iran as a distinct entity. Iran as a country which has its own history. Iran which is a country which is different from all the other entrances. 
They talk about Iran, and they talk about Iranian people. They don't talk about the protected domains. They don't talk about all, all, all these majesties realm. They talk about Iran, and they talk about Iranian people. Another person which I like very much, and I thought is, is Mizar Yusuf Khan Mustashar al-Dole. Mustashar al-Dole not only worked for uh, Nasser al Shah, he lived long enough to work for Muzaffar al Shah too. So he worked for two different ones. While he was, again, while he was in Europe, he was the Iranian consul in Europe, in correspondence with Malcolm Khan. The anecdote is that this is, he wrote a letter to Malcolm Khan and asked Malcolm Khan, why the Europeans are so progressive, so advanced, as Iranians, the land of Islam, we are so backward, quote unquote. Malcolm Khan said the, the answer, the secret to the European success is one word, and that's the rule of law. So, Mustashar al writes a book, and the name of the book is One Word. The name of the book is Yer Kalameh. In fact, Yer Kalameh, the book that he writes, is a Persian translation of the French Declaration of the Rights of the Man and of the Citizens of 1789. Mustashar al translates the French Code of Law and adds a lot of Quranic and Islamic teachings to that. Because he knows that in 19th century Iran is still those two centers of power hold a lot of sway. So he translates the French Code of Law. And every page and for every paragraph, he adds hadith, he adds the quotes from the Quran, from the example of the Prophet. But the funny thing is that Nasser bin Shah, the monarch, like every other monarch, was not able to tolerate it. I'm just going to quote from the introduction of the academy what Mustashar al wrote. And again, he's trying to be conservative. He doesn't challenge the Islamic establishment in Iran because he, like Ahmad Zadeh and Malcolm Khan and some other intellectuals which I'm not talking about today, if you want to know about other intellectuals, I'm very happy to answer your questions. They know that they cannot challenge Islam head to head yet. Whatever good laws exist in Afghanistan with which those nations have achieved perfect progress, your prophet has said and explained a thousand and two hundred and eight years ago for the nation of Islam. One is promoting this idea that Islamic law is compatible with European infidel, secular, whatever law. Second, he has this idea of the land of Islam or land of Iran and the land of Europe, so he knows there's a distinction. What happened, the anecdote, is that Nasser Tisha was so unhappy with the book that when they imprisoned Mustashar al at the time he was seven years old, he was quite an old man, the monarch ordered that he be exactly be tortured with his own book. So the executioners had copies of Hikalamed al and hit him on the head with his own book, with the same translation. So that was his punishment. So, another recap. These are the territories that the Iranians lost in the 19th century. These are the territories that they lost to the Russians in the north, and they had for 18th and 19th century a lot of skirmishes on their borders with the Ottoman Empire. So they lost some territories. And they had some fights with the British, of course, everybody had fights with the Red Coast. The thing is that Afghanistan was very close to India, and India is the jewel of Her Majesty's crown. So whatever was happening in India was extremely important to the British. Muhammad Shah in 1830s and 1840s, Nasser Din Shah in 1860s, they tried to go, they tried to come, they tried to go and take care of Harat. Harat is very close to the Iranian border. When they sent the Qajar troops to Harat, the British retaliated by sending the, the navy to the Persian Gulf region and occupying parts of the Bushehr. To me, to my research, I don't seek the answers to why they did that. To me, what matters is that in 19th century, the Qajars have the pressures on their borders. Is tangible for them. They realize that we have borders which need to be protected, we have borders which need to be specified, and they have this new identity of Iran as a separate entity. No longer do they think that Iran has includes certain territories in the Ottoman Empire. They, they are forced to realize that their country has certain borders which might not be that protectable. Now, as a result of that, the Vajras started paying attention to a couple of modern sciences. Nasser Din Shah himself, who you can see that's the, 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 the way that he took to go to Europe. Nasser Din Shah himself, the sponsored translation of foreign geographies. Nasser Din Shah himself ordered the establishment of a royal bureau of translation. And all these intellectuals started paying attention to geography and historiography. Geography because they needed to know what's going on, and physically they were forced to know about their borders. Historiography, because most of the 19th century intellectuals inside the Bajar court and outside the Bajar court, they were trying to find the secret to the European progress. And in order to find that secret to the European progress, 
they, they started studying uh, European history very closely. So in the 19th century, they had this new understanding of geography and historiography in Iran. And my research shows that this new understanding of historiography, history, what's happening in the world, and geography, how do we understand what, is nowhere better represented than in 19th century travel laws. According to a few sources that I consulted, there are more than 200 Persian travelers by Iranians who traveled to Europe, to Ottoman Empire, they went to Russia in the 19th century. And my research, I looked at 70 of them, I didn't have access to all of them, I didn't have the time to read all of them. But I've consulted 70 of these travel logs, domestic and foreign. And I'm trying to see what's going on in those travel logs. I'm saying that these travel logs start to portray the world in more concrete terms. In 18th century, in 17th century, if you go back to Safar, Nomen, Nasser, Fosro, the Persians were the Persian travelers. They could be of Arab origin, some of them use the word Persian. The people who traveled and wrote in Persian have this, I'm not going to vague, I'm going to call this a broad representation of foreign world. They say, I went to Damascus, I saw this, I saw that. But they don't tell you a historical representation of Damascus. They don't tell you what were the people doing at that time, and why the people were doing whatever they were doing at that time. I'm going to give you some descriptions. Now that I've talked about His Majesty, Shadow of God, Pivot of the Universe, the second half of the 19th century, in the current historiography, specifically historiography coming out of Iran, is like every other place. Right now, most of the historiography in Iran tends to bash Nasser Din Shah as a womanizer. Yes, it's true, he had 120 wives. It's true, he had more than 200 concubines. Yes, he had that too. But at the same time, he was the most prolific Persian monarch. He has a beautiful anthology of sonnets for his various wives. He has nine domestic travelers and three European travelers. Each European traveler is around 300 pages. His Majesty took the pain to write about that. For whatever reason, he has left us with a lot of material. His Majesty had his advisors, he had a, he called him Hakim Toulouzan. Dr. Toulouzan was the French uh, physician to His Majesty. He forced the French physician to read him the French newspapers on a weekly basis, at the end of every week. And I'm getting this information from the memoirs of his Ministry of Culture, Etamad al-Saltane. He forced the person in the court who knew Ottoman to read him the Ottoman newspaper. He forced the people who knew the French to read him the French newspaper. He wasn't even interested in what's going on in India. He asked some of the courtiers to read him about, about India. So in my research, this person, which in current historiography tends to be just a womanizer and whatever that they call him these days, is very significant in the second half of the 19th century. On the one hand, you have the dissident intellectuals, but on the other hand, people like Nasser Disha enable this intellectual process going on. He's the guy who sponsored a lot of translations. I'm going to give you some descriptions of how these 19th century travelers describe Europe and what I mean that they offer a concrete historical representation of Europe. So here's my quotation. So this is Nasser Din Shah. He's describing the port of Liverpool in 1873. To me, this is not general. He says Liverpool is a big city. And he's a large port and trade post of England that often has dealings with the New World. He talks about the New World, the connection between Europe and the New World. They trade with the New World in wheat and cotton. The wheat in England is not enough for their consumption, and many immigrants go from England, Germany, and other countries to the New World from this port. So he gives a historical picture of the, the port of Liverpool. And that's the other one I'm going to talk about. Similarly, the Iranian merchant, what's his name, Mohim Saltane, who came to the U.S., he was a super rich person who came to the U.S. in 1893. He describes the Columbus exhibition in this. And what I take from his description of Columbus exhibition is that because there's a new understanding of history, and history, to me, is representation of time. When we had the analytic tradition before the 19th century, the unit of time that they chose to represent was a year, or a dynasty, or the lifetime of a great full-time quote map. So history to me is playing with time. In 19th century, that time frame becomes smaller and smaller. They talk about people, they talk about shorter periods of time, they talk about years sometimes that they talk about, they talk about math. So I believe that 19th century travelogues reflect this new conceptualization of time. In their narratives, and I'm going to quote to Moino Saltane, when he goes to the exhibition, he writes about different time frames in the world. This is unprecedented before the 19th century. Nobody cares about time before the 19th century. 
In Chicago time, the clock is one hour and a quarter to noon. In London time, it is four hours and 50 minutes afternoon. In Paris time, it is uh, four hours and 50 minutes afternoon. In Madrid time, it is four hours and 35 minutes afternoon. He goes on to talk about 20 different countries. This is a part of his consent, and this guy is not even a prominent intellectual. He's just one of the Iranians who is living in this intellectual media. So again, there's a new conception of time. He feels the urge to tell his readers, his potential readers, that I know there are different time zones in the world. And this is, to me, part of the whole deal with the new historiography. Similarly, the way they talk about geography, whenever they're talking about new places, they give you descriptive geography. They give you detailed information about the land. They give you information that you can identify with. And I call that, what I call narrative maps of the world. Through their narratives, they construct for you history, and they construct for you geography. And that's how they describe see. Who is this guy? This is Mirza Hadi Adavi Shirazi, who traveled to Russia in 1840, the second decade of 19th century. And this is the time that the Russians at Tiflisi, the Bajar monarch, had conceded those areas in Azerbaijan and Georgia to Russians. According to the Russian law, a woman enjoys conservative powers, and regardless of all her actions and behaviors, and wherever she goes and with whoever she talks, a man cannot question her. Because a woman's freedom is invested in herself. She wants whoever she wants. Nowadays, the people of Tbilisi have observed this law because of Russian dominance. This is a time in Iran when you still have anger. It's still polygamy is practiced. So when that person is describing the Russian control in Tbilisi, he's offering a concrete, tangible picture of what's happening and why that is happening in Tbilisi. And this is new to me. Because I couldn't find similar descriptions in pre-19th century <coughs> excuse me, travelers. Similarly, Moino Saltane, uh, the affluent merchant who came to the US in the last decade of the 19th century, described the United States Congress in 1893 in the following way. A large room is the sitting place of the speak, the speaker. There are 395 representatives of the nation and the government, representative of the vocaloid, do that and millet. Again, the idea of the nation is new. They will propose an issue, and after it has been discussed by the representatives and they speak, they refer the issue to another, where 88 representatives attend to and debate it. And if they approve it, they, spend, they send it to the president to sign. Again, to me, it doesn't matter how accurate this description is. I can't go to historical references in the US history and find that out. But to me, what matters is that these Persian travelers have this consciousness, that they have this preoccupation to offer a concrete history of the world. And again, this is in tune with what is happening in Iran with the intellectual discourse. And with all this, I connect that to the most famous fictional narrative of uh, 19th century, Siad Nome Blind Day. According to contemporary historiographers, people like uh, Nazim al Kerman, people like Ahmad Kastrali, the Siyahad Nami Ibrahim Beg by Zinul Abedin and Maral Abey, his book, Siyahad Nami, I have it here, was so famous, quote unquote, that whoever read that felt a shiver in his body because the book was so influential. The book was a favorite of the secret guilds, Iranian secret guilds at the turn of the 20th century, and people who, uh, thank you, people who, people who were uh, involved in the constitutional revolution. Excuse me. So, what I'm trying to show is that this book is so successful because the writer is not writing the tide of the travelogue writing in 19th century Iran, but he's using the conventions of the travelogue writing to write about Iran. The story of the Siad Nome is about this super nationalistic, to some degree, chauvinistic Iranian who is living in Egypt at the time. His father passes away, and the father tells him that he should go to Iran. Iran has all these reforms. Nasrat Shah is perfect. Everything is in order. The schools are amazing. Iranian progress is on par with the European progress. So the writer uses this perspective of a foreigner who goes to Iran, similar to all the 19th century travel writers who travel from Iran to Iran. And this literary device going from the known to the unknown by paying attention to the geography, to the historiography, was what made his book very successful. The content of his book, that was a favorite of the constitutionalists, is promotion of liberal ideas. And I'm going to give you some quotations of those liberal ideas. For example, this is a traditional knife that in Iran, and you can see somebody is very nice to the Bastian Lodin here, you know, that was the way that they taught children back in the day. 
Quote unquote, the narrator of the seal had no the fictional travel. If the Maktash, the schools of the homeland, again, there's a new idea of homeland, the place that Iranians belong to. If the Maktabs of the homeland become reformed, as we know, and the children of the homeland study common sciences and skills, they, they don't need to lie to earn a living or to be happy with somebody else's loss or to betray their homeland, nation, and government. The fake philosopher's stone of the Easterners is nothing but the attainment of knowledge. So in the book, through using the medium of the travel writing, he promotes the liberal ideas. He also talks about the lack of law in Iran. This is a common, I can't say, execution by canon in Shiraz in Iran in the late 19th century. Ugh, I don't know how far that guy would jump after they find the canon. But again, the ideas that the writer of the book promotes. Today, there is no other land except for Iran where a respectable merchant would be belittled and harassed by government lackey. Everywhere, there are rights and rules, and the responsibilities and restrictions of, restrictions of the ruler and the rule are defined, except for Iran. In every land, the government taxes have been divided among people equally, except for Iran. The servants of the government will pay their taxes at a certain time to the government, except Iran. In every land, the nation and the government act to defend the country together, except for Iran. In no corner of the world, are the religious figures involved in political affairs except in Iran. In no place on earth are the sacred places, houses of the ulama, and the lodgings of the nobles, safe havens of thieves, swindlers, and criminals except for Iran. He said, Prince Maisiel had now a book from the beginning to the end. I have no children to carry my name. That book will be my successor and the most senior of my children, so that the people of my homeland will not forget my name. Even in his wish, is offering this idea of Iran as a homeland. So the conclusion, my small contribution to the of Iran studies, is that number one, the reason that his Siyahad was so successful is that very smartly, he used the conventions of the travelogue writing in Iran. He knew that this is the age of the travelogue writing, so he used the travelogue format to write about the Iran, about the geography of Iran, about the history of Iran, about what was going on in contemporary Iran. And the content of the book, the ideas, the themes espoused in the work, are reflections of the major intellectuals of the day, like Malcolm, Malcolm Khan, Mustafa Dole, and Ahmed Zadar. I think I'm good in time. So thank you for listening.